For the most part, video games tend to fit pretty neatly into their silly little genres. This is obviously a platformer, this is obviously a puzzle game, this is a fighting game, this is a sports game, this is a first person shooter, this is a sexy poker for the Nintendo Wii. By and large, developers have always made their games with specific genres in mind, and they try to stick as closely to that genre as possible. Maybe there's a little wiggle room here and there, but at the end of the day, even an action RPG is still an RPG. But as the games industry grew older and technology got better and disk space got bigger, the people making games started to have a lot more freedom in the types of things they could put into each game they made. So we started to see games with diverse and creative lineups of side content. Things like the slot machines in Pokemon, the fishing minigames in Zelda, and the entirety of Sonic 1 in Sonic Generations. Developers were effectively adding cute little distractions to their cute little distractions, and for the most part, it was fucking awesome. It also helped that developers always seemed to know when enough was enough. They always seemed to know when they had the right amount of side content in their games. They always seemed to know when the distractions had become distracting enough, and it was time to get back to the main focus. They always seemed to know when to stop adding more content. Or at least, most of them did. My personal favorite example of this phenomena is the recently released Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. Formerly known as the Yakuza series and recently renamed to match its Japanese title, the Like a Dragon series is infamous for the insane amount of side content that the developers at Ryuga Kotoko Studios managed to cram into these games on top of the 80 hour stories, complex combat systems, 50 plus side quests, open world gameplay, and multiple playable protagonists. <laughs> Several games in the franchise have complex and comprehensive minigames based on things like bowling, baseball, ping pong, karaoke, poker, and mahjong, not to mention a bunch of random ass full arcade games thrown in just because they own the rights. And on top of that, nearly every game in the franchise has their own unique side modes that are long enough and complex enough to be their own separate games. Yakuza 0 has two separate management sims, Yakuza 3 has fishing, Yakuza 5 has a crazy taxi clone, Yakuza 6 has baseball, and amongst other things, Yakuza Kiwami had this. What the fuck is Yakuza even about, bro? And Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth doesn't just uphold this tradition, it takes it to the next level. Obviously, you've got series staples like darts, shogi, mahjong, blackjack, golf, baseball, and a karaoke minigame with a song list long enough to be its own separate game, but it's also got an entire fighting game, a 3D beat-em-up with gameplay similar to that of the original Yakuza games, three separate fishing minigames, one of which actually is its own standalone game, a Pokemon Snap clone, a dating simulator, and whatever the fuck this is. Not to mention a fully developed Pokemon clone where you battle, catch, and train enemies, collect gym badges, and eventually challenge the champion. And a whole ass Animal Crossing New Horizons ripoff where you travel to a deserted island and turn it into a five star resort through the power of catching fish, collecting bugs, and crafting furniture. Genuinely what the fuck. And that's not even everything in this game. There is genuinely enough content in this game to justify only ever owning one game for the rest of your life because it's actually more like 20 games. Oh, I get it. The subtitle Infinite Wealth refers to the near infinite amount of things that you can do in this game. Just kidding, I know that it actually refers to Ichiban Kasuga's massive itchy balls and Kasu. Believe it or not, Fortnite is another great example. Of course, it wasn't always. Fortnite was originally just a PvE game called Save the World, but absolutely nobody cared about it, so they turned it into a battle royale, and suddenly people started to pay attention. And then they started adding things like skins and battle passes and item shops, and now everyone had to get in on the action. And as a result, uh, Fortnite's negative impact on the gaming industry will be studied for generations. But also, the game ended up being a lot of fun. And you gotta admit, some of these skins are actually pretty cool. Spider-Man, Batman, Goku, Zuko, Peter Griffin, Doomguy, Kratos, 8-Ball vs. Scratch, The Rock, those two furries everybody wants to have sex with, me if I was a girl. Smash! But of course, the developer Epic Games wasn't happy with simply having the single most popular and financially lucrative video game ever made, 
ever, they also wanted to be the only game anyone ever played. So slowly but surely, the devs started adding new modes. They added obvious things like creative and zero build. They introduced a racing game developed by the company that made Rocket League and a rhythm game developed by the people who made Guitar Hero. Genuinely, what the fuck? And don't even get me started on the procedurally generated open world survival sandbox masterpiece that is LEGO Fortnite. Sure, it's a bit derivative, but what non-indie isn't these days? But Epic Games didn't stop there. They also provided players with the tools to make and release their own custom games and modes, as well as a platform for people to find and play them. That's right, maybe they made it Roblox. And as a result, the sheer number of things you can do in this already jam-packed game has skyrocketed. Of course, not everything the community puts out is good and most of it is exactly what you'd expect, but the shit that is actually worth your time is really worth your time. There is so much quality, content, and variety across both Fortnite's official and community-generated modes that you could effectively play just Fortnite forever because damn near everything you'd ever want to play is on here in some capacity. Of course, Fortnite is far from the first game to prominently feature user-generated content in this style. There's an entire industry dedicated to this shit. Gmod, Dreams, Mario Maker, Minecraft, technically Skyrim, fucking hell, I just compared this shit to Roblox. And credit where credit is due, every single one of these games has compiled a massive treasure trove of user-generated content, provided hundreds, if not thousands, of unique game modes and permanently altered the gaming industry, but Fortnite is the game doing it right this second, and what they've got going on is pretty impressive in terms of sheer volume and variety of experiences available. Of course, not every game can rely on fan-generated content and online multiplayer to help it become a thousand things at once, and that's where Infinite Wealth comes in. But it's also where another one of Ryu Gakutoko's games makes an appearance. Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania is a top-to-bottom remake of the original three home console Super Monkey Ball games for modern hardware. It was Sega's second attempt at testing the waters for the potential reception of a new Super Monkey Ball game, and thank fuck that it worked out because a lot of people were really not happy about this one. I mean, I personally enjoyed it, but I also didn't grow up playing these games, and even as a casual enjoyer and series newcomer, I could kind of tell why diehard fans were so disappointed with this release. But you could play as Kiryu Kazuma, so actually this was a 10 out of 10 the whole time. Unsurprising for the studio that made the Yakuza games, Ryu Gakutoku Studios was not happy simply remaking three entire games. They also stuffed this neat little package absolutely full of side content. Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania has bowling, golf, racing, billiards, aerial combat, and boating, amongst many other things. There really is a lot to do outside of just the main campaign, and no two modes are really the same thing. And as a result, Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania ends up being a slightly underwhelming but ultimately really fun single player game with a really, really cool party game stitched on top of it. Not that I can ever get any of my friends to actually play it with me. Oh, we want to play Smash. Oh, we want to play Mario Party. Yeah, well, I want to play Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania, and I'm only kind of going to enjoy it. Actually, party games in general are really, really great for this sort of thing. For example, I mean, when else am I gonna get a chance to talk about Wii Party, right? Wii Party is sort of the forgotten middle child of the Wii series, if you could even call this a series. Damn near everybody grew up playing Wii Sports, Wii Play, and Wii Fit, and anyone who was paying attention at the time remembers the disaster that was Wii Music's big E3 reveal. But no one ever seems to remember Wii Party. Wii Party, much like its siblings, is a lot of things at once. It's a board game, it's a game show, it's a bingo night, it's Hot Potato, it's Marco Polo, and so much more. None of its game modes really fit together, they don't really make sense as a part of the same package, but at the same time, none of them could really exist on their own. So instead, they've all kind of been smushed together into one single game. And despite all odds, it actually kind of works. Normally, this many conflicting game modes would lead to an incoherent and confusing mess, but if there's one thing the Wii series was always good at, it was being everything all at once. Fuck! I should have talked about Wii Play instead! What is wrong with me? 
NES Remix Volumes 1 and 2 are a pair of games that do exactly what their title implies. They take all of the most beloved and iconic games from the NES's first party library and remix them in all kinds of new and creative ways, effectively creating brand new levels for games old enough to raise children. The gang's all here, Mario, Zelda, Excite Bike, Kid Icarus, Balloon Fight, Donkey Kong, Punch-Out, Kirby, and those are just the guys on the front of the box. There's a lot more than just that in here. The NES Remix games are effectively massive DLC packs for the NES's entire first party library released nearly 20 years after the console was discontinued. So many different games are represented in this package and they all feel unique and distinct not only from one another, but also from their initial iterations. The NES Remix games aren't just a pair of games trying to be everything at the same time, they are the NES's entire first party library all on one disc. And it's actually pretty fucking cool and quite possibly the ultimate example of a game that tries to be everything. So there you have it, a short and not very comprehensive list of games that try to be everything. In hindsight, I definitely could have and probably should have talked about games like Roblox and Gmod and Dreams and Replay and Minecraft and Nintendo Land and a billion other titles that all fit into this niche while also being infinitely more popular than some of the ones I actually did end up talking about. But honestly, I just wasn't really in the mood to talk about any of those games. No. Uh, I wanted to talk about Wii Party and NES Remix, and I fucking did it.